Elon Musk's tweets uh, have long been a lightning rod for criticism and controversy, even more so now that he owns the platform. In an exclusive interview with CBC's David Faber this week, Musk said, it's all about free speech. You know, I'm reminded of uh, the, the, the scene in The Princess Bride. Great movie. Great movie. Um, where he confronts the person who killed his father. And he says, offer me money, offer me power, I don't care. So you just don't care. You want to share what you have to say? I'll say what I want to say, and if, 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 uh, if the consequence of that is losing money, so be it. Join us right now to talk about Musk's commentary, free speech on social media, AI, and so much more. Joe Lonsdale, founding partner of 8VC and co-founder of Palantir. You know Elon very well. I'm curious just what, you, what was your takeaway from that exchange? Well, you know, Andrew, I'm glad he's being a, a, a role model in the sense to so many others. I think the biggest cowards in America are those who run the Fortune 500 companies and those who run big funds. You know, there's a sense that there's one side that's corrupt, you can't criticize. In any society, you want to understand how authoritarianism works. It's a side you're not allowed to go against. They want to have like an inevitable victory of their ideology and everyone just shut up, go along. And, it, and you know, in, that, and in Elon's view and in my view, this is, you know, hurting hundreds of thousands of vulnerable people in our cities. It's breaking lots of things. And it's, it's a duty of people to speak up and say what they think. Can, can you square one part of this, though, for us, which is... You know, Elon says, money, power, you know, I'll do it, I'll, I'll, I don't care. And yet the truth is, when it comes to doing business in China, when it comes to doing business in Turkey, we, you know, we, he's now limited uh, what's, what's publishable in, in Turkey, in part because uh, the country has said, we don't want you doing that. Other companies, other tech companies, Google, Facebook, others, have said, we're not going to actually play in these markets because we actually don't want to have to deal with those laws and those rules. I think, I think that's a very fair point. I think every company has a very tough decision to make. Do you turn off everything in that country or do you leave things on in that country and, and go along with the rules? And, and I, you know, I, I personally but what, think... But what does that say a, then about uh, power guy. and money? If you really are willing to... If, if power and money it don't matter and you will say whatever you want, no matter what you want, the principle... If this is really about just straight-up principles... You'd say, you know what, I can't, I can't do business with those people. I can't do business in China. This is just not for me. I'm not doing it. And actually, the stand I'm taking is a strictly principled one. And what I, the reason I I'm think, suggesting I, I, that there's something else no, here I, beyond. I think, I, think, I, think, I think you're right that everyone running a big company on the international stage today who does any business at all in any of these countries is going to make some compromises. And I think it's good to be transparent at the very least about it. I actually do think, yeah, Andrew, that most... But the other social media companies, is my understanding, is do follow the rules in Turkey as well. They just don't talk about it out loud. Uh, so, you know, I, I personally, am, I, I, yeah, I'm very troubled by that. I don't, I don't think that guy running Turkey is a good person. I think he's very scary. But I understand. You, I, you're right. Companies do make compromises to do business in these places. There's no, there's no, it's very hard to be a perfectly pure person. I think being able to stand up as much as you can is a good thing. And people are going to make trade-offs where they decide to stand up. I think that's, that's okay. correct. Let's pivot this conversation to AI, because there is this sort of interesting free speech issue around AI as well. And actually, Elon, I think, to the extent that he's pursuing a, a, a sort of competitor to a chat GPT or to a Google Bard or to an Anthropic or what have you, um, is really about creating an AI where you can say that the AI will, will speak in whatever language and say whatever it wants, whereas what you've seen over the last several months is ChatGPT now in partnership with Microsoft, they've put some guardrails around what AI will come back with in terms of the responses and the, and the answers and the reasoning. Similarly, Google uh, and BARD have been even more particularly uniquely cautious, perhaps. Um, are those good decisions, bad decisions? And what happens on the other side if the view is that there's no decisions? Well, you know, I don't know exactly what Elon's doing there. I'm good friends with, with a lot of people at OpenAI. I know Sam Well, a lot of people running that place, you know, used to work with me on Palantir and otherwise. And, you know, I think open, open AI is, is doing extraordinary things. I think the question, the trade-off, Andrew, there's, there's, first of all, yes, how do you much you censor yourself? I definitely don't think the government should be involved. That's terrifying. I think it should be terrifying to all of us because this is, this is going to run so many workflows in our society. 
and, and having that decided top down. I don't think that's right. I, I, I think we got to be very careful. I think there is regulation we should think about, which is that it's not clear we want autocrats to have access to this. And so it's, it's you know, Sam testified this week, as you saw in Congress. Yep. And, and I, and I, think, I think this idea of a regulatory agency that touches anything other than the existential issue is a big mistake, because I think the existential issue, which we all have, is that this it may be the GPT-12 in 10 years is powerful enough that it could do things to destroy stuff. And, and, and the question is, who gets to have a giant, you know, giant super right. clusters of GPUs? And I think that's the most interesting regulatory question. I think the rest of it, there should be multiple of them. It should be decided by industry bottom up. How much, though, of the even the conversation about regulation on AI is just hot air? And when I say that, and I'm not being dismissive, I'm glad, uh, frankly, folks like Sam are so early in trying to bring this conversation to the discourse. But the Washington, as you know, as well as anybody, uh, has been behind on, in terms of even thinking about regulation the entire time. And we've, we're still debating whether there should be regulation around social media, around privacy, around so many different issues. And, you know, if, if there was regulation, you would have thought that those things would have been dealt with already. You know, it, it's, if, if this stuff works the way it looks like it's going, Drew, Andrew, this could be a third industrial revolution, right? This could be like the late 19th century all over again, which I know a lot of people didn't say they don't like that era, but you have to keep in mind that during 30 years, the average wealth doubled in this country, more than doubled in this country. Everyone benefited from that massively. I think that could happen again here. It's going to be really interesting this time because the people whose jobs is finally replacing, it's no longer just like the shoemaker or the barrel maker. It's going to be making lawyers more efficient. It's going to be making bureaucrats more efficient. A lot of people who run everything in our government are going to be able to be you know, replaced with a ratio of 10 to 1, just getting more done. So they're going to want to regulate it. I think you're right. Right now, they have no idea how to do it. And, you know, I don't think we do know how to do it until we see what happens.